Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest, Swedish original, movie, thoughts. I suppose I'll start with the ending. It didn't really feel like that was what we should have been building up to. Maybe it was what these two movies sort of built towards, but I just don't see... I don't know, when I watched the first movie, I didn't think it would end with Salander outsmarting a big hulking brute. It just didn't occur to me. It didn't feel like that's that was where it was headed at all. Yeah, and you know, in the second one he reminded me a lot of the Russian. In this one, in that last scene, tell me you don't see the Punish, the Terminator. Just, you know what, it's, it's gonna be difficult through a camera, but look me right in the eye and tell me that that is not the Terminator, that that is not Arnie in the exoskeleton and with the, yeah, come on. Or is it endoskeleton? I always get them mixed up. That's, yeah, where, where did that come from? What does that have to do with this whole, you know, I thought it was about perverted men who have authority over women and use it to hide their abuse of them, you know? I, I thought that was enough for these before that ending. And I do like that she doesn't kill him, but that the bikers do. I guess that's why they were in this movie, you know? That's why, you know, they were even brought back from the second one, because they do nothing in this movie other than exist and find the dead body of one of their buddies who Blondie killed because... because. And yeah, so they have a motive for revenge and they go ahead and kill him because he was stupid enough. I guess he never played a first person shooter game in multiplayer. You do not stand still for several seconds when there's someone around who is fighting you. What, what, what was he doing, you know? Again, this is kind of... The movie suddenly makes him stupid because it needs him to be stupid. All that other time, he was incredibly powerful. You know, how about that first time where we see him still working, wearing that really not cool sweater? If the object might be something you would expect your grandmother to give you for a Christmas present, it is not cool. I, I feel quite confident that there are no exceptions to that rule. Yeah, so, you know, he wakes up, he, you know, he beats up the two cops, you know, kills them. One of them, I, did she not have a gun? You know, she had plenty of time to grab the gun and point it. The worst thing is, they're driving there and they actually hear over the police radio, we hear it too. Consider him armed and dangerous. And they just... He's right there. Did they not get a good description of him? He's blonde. He's wearing a dorky sweater. That's him, right there on the pavement. Anyway. Yeah, suddenly he's stupid, and he stands still for long enough for her to nail him to the ground. And, you know, in between making the videos about the second movie and, you know, watching the third movie and now recording this, I actually read the supposed explanation for him to be so frickin' invulnerable. He has this genetic disease or something, you know, congenital disease, where he can't feel pain. Okay, I can see how that might mean that he, you know, you can really punish him and he can just keep on coming. But it just doesn't... I don't know, it doesn't completely, I don't completely buy it as that he would be such a good fighter from that. I, it seems like there would be some downsides to something like that, you know, if you can't, you know, it's not just pain he wouldn't feel, as, as far as I understand, you can't just not feel 
the pain, or, or at least that's not my understanding of this character. He doesn't feel any, you know, physical stimuli. So that would actually mean he would really have a handicap there that he'd have to contend with. I guess that's like how, you know, Salander herself should also not just be this perfect, you know, in the second one and in this, she's kind of just, yeah, again, born light. It, it more in the second than this, but there's almost nothing, you know, she almost doesn't make any mistakes, and she's almost impossible to defeat, and that again, you know, it just takes away tension. Again, the first movie did not do that. I really, really liked the psychiatrist character. <laughs> like, I hated him, but that was what I was supposed to. And I'm told by my girlfriend that there was a flashback in the book that was really disturbing that they didn't put in this movie. Yeah, he. I thought he was sufficiently creepy and disgusting. I didn't need the flashback that they apparently took out, so... Yeah. I thought that the whole conspiracy thing, you know, the section, worked decently enough, and I liked how you could see what they were doing, you know, that you could... It, it made it feel, early on at least, impossible to defeat them, you know, because, you know, they steal both the copy and the original of the report, you know, in just... In, the matter, in a matter of minutes. And they, excuse me, they threaten the reporter, editor, woman, you know, the shocked looking one, into, you know, sort of giving up. And that, that did seem a little like, I don't know, just like, was that really the best they could do? But I don't know, I guess it did sort of towards work. I did wonder a little if, you know, the whole thing with the conspiracy wouldn't more or less work out by just waiting five minutes and letting the poor old people just die of, you know, the diseases they have and whatnot, but okay. I did think that, I don't know, maybe I missed it in the movie. Maybe it's better in the book. But in this movie, I could not figure out how they could suddenly just arrest all these people. I get that they had this squad that was, you know, investigating them. They already had some proof they were talking about. And they were following them, so they, you know, got pictures and names and identities. I just miss the scene where there's, like, this thing of, you know, okay, now we have everything we need. Let's go out and just arrest them. I, there was a scene where there were like five or six group leaders of different groups, I guess, and they were, I don't know, sent out, and I guess not long after that, the people started getting arrested, but I don't know, I just, I didn't see the scene where they, you know, actually have something, they put their finger on, this is what we can bust them on, you know. I also didn't fully understand why the the reports, the, the journal stuff from 1993 and 1994, you know, about how, no, she was, you know, she spent over a year strapped to the bed. Why was that? inadmissible. Why didn't that work as evidence? That just felt like, you know, I don't know if it's Steve Lawson or if it's the, you know, scriptwriters or whatever. I don't even know if he was the scriptwriter. Anyway, someone just couldn't figure out why that wouldn't work as evidence, but they needed it not to, so they just have the judge say, it doesn't work as evidence. And I just don't buy it. I. I want an explanation, you know. It, yeah. 
I am a little torn on whether Lisbeth was too, you know, in, in the, at the hearing, she was kind of very, I don't know, is empower the word? I don't know exactly what word to use, but the way she spoke, she was very determined and kind of, you know, there was only one time where she went over the line and the judge said, you know, use nice language, young lady. And, yeah, it, other than that, there was like, you know, I didn't hear a question in there, and you're saying that I already answered the question, and you say that my answer would be that, but it's not, so give me a chance to answer it. That whole thing, I don't know, I'm torn on it. I don't, I can't quite decide with myself if that was, like, really cool and just fitted, and that was what we wanted after seeing so much freaking abuse of this poor woman in these three movies, or if it was a little sappy, kind of easy, you know, that just, you know, I don't know. That might be about it. I thought it was a little annoying how Blondie just disappeared for, I don't know, a half hour of the movie for no real reason. And we have no idea what he was doing for that time. And then he's suddenly just at, you know, Zalander's old place. Or says, yeah, Zala's place, you know, where they had her on the couch before they drove her out into the woods. You know, it just... Why did she need to go back there, and why was he suddenly there? Uh, again, other than having him killed off. And I submit to you, if he had died at the end of the second movie, if he had not been in this movie, like Zala essentially wasn't, you know. What a moron, by the way. Just lying there, strapped to a bed, thinking that he can threaten one section member after another. Yeah. Anyway, why did Blondie need to be in this film? Did he do anything other than set up this fight at the end, which really wasn't a fight as much as just her outsmarting him and then having bikers kill him? You know, he didn't really do anything else. Maybe it's different in the book. May and hey, maybe I am missing something. Please do explain it to me if I am. It just didn't seem like... And I get that he was a threat to Lisbeth. And if it had felt more like he had been, that would have been fine. But he points a gun at her once, and then the police is nearby, and she runs away from the window. Did he really think he was going to get her that time? I mean, he seemed like he was smarter than that, at least a little bit. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's everything I have. I've reviewed other parts of this series. The links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.